Hi everybody and welcome back to part three on kernel extended dynamic mode decomposition. What we have discussed until now is the issue that if we want to compute DMD or an approximation of the Koopman operator, we run into trouble if either the number of samples is very large, uh, this is little m, or the number of basis functions becomes very large, this capital N. And for the M, the large data problem, so to say, we had a solution that we computed these A and G matrices, which were made up of inner products between these feature matrices, Psi X times Psi X and Psi X times Psi Y. However, this gives us N by N matrices so in the dimension of the features. And we learned that this is particularly challenging if we have high dimensional state spaces and then lift this to, let's say, monomials. So this blows up very quickly. And we wanted to get rid of this n dimension. And we found out that, inspired by many other branches, branches of learning, machine learning, um, the kernel trick is something that we can really make use of. This means that instead of explicitly evaluating these inner products, we define a kernel function. And then the evaluation of the kernel function spits out the result of this inner product. And so, then what we defined or found out is that you can define A and G matrices in their head version, so to say, which explicitly work on kernel evaluations. And you can then use these instead of the A and G matrices to compute a K hat matrix, which is in this M by M space. So only scales with the number of samples. And then we saw that actually this is a straightforward procedure. Given A and G, you compute an eigenvalue decomposition of the G hat matrix. We use this and the A hat matrix to compute our K hat matrix in the M by M dimensions, and then perform an eigenvalue decomposition of this K hat matrix. What's left to study is the computation of Koopman eigenfunctions and Koopman modes in this kernel setting without having to go to the original state space. There is one exception if we want to lift our data later on to um, or compute these Koopman modes, then we have to actually go to this high dimensional space. This Psi X therefore should only be the full state observable if we want to study uh, the Koopman modes. We will see this in, in the code example later as well. Okay, but before we do this, let's you know, derive this in a little bit more detail. We have seen these equations uh, a few times already where we have these eigenfunctions that are defined on a subspace approximately by this feature matrix and then multiplied by the eigenvectors of the K matrix. And similarly, the Koopman modes were given by multiplication of the left eigenvectors with this projection matrix from the dictionary back to our observable G. That could be the full state observable or any observable function that is a linear combination of our dictionary of functions. And now the problem is that these eigenvectors are in high dimensions and the projection matrix is also in high dimension, which means that we need to reformulate this kernel wise. And we are going to start with the eigenfunctions, but not on arbitrary x like here. This is the second step. But let's start with all the sample sites that we already have. So all the eigenfunctions evaluated, so component-wise, on the individual samples. And what you can do is you can simply rewrite this in matrix form, so it's the Psi X, and then these are the eigenvectors Psi. So column-wise, this gives us the eigenfunctions 1 to N, evaluated not on arbitrary X, but on the data samples that we already have. What we can do next is something that we have used before. So if you're uncertain what is happening here, um, in the previous video, we have talked about this a little bit. We can replace the eigenvector matrix in this high dimensional space by the basis, uh, basis of the space, right? Due to the SVD, we have such a basis. And then use coefficients. And these were exactly the eigenvectors in this lower dimensional space. So without going into detail, the range of this psi matrix is the same as the range of this Q matrix. So this is an equivalent replacement and the eigenvectors in this lower dimensional space specifically give me the coefficients. So this is 
uh, that this is an equivalent expression. And this now gives me room to play around with the SVD once more. Okay, so the Q matrix can be replaced by you know, multiplying from the left with U transposed and then multiplying from the left with sigma inverse gives me Q transposed and then I can transpose by again flipping the order. Right? Remember, since this is an SVD, transposed is the same as inverse. So I can replace this, right? This one stays where it is, and then I can replace this simply by psi x transposed u and then sigma inverse, and this one stays where it is. Again, so this is simply using the SVD and the definition of how to invert and then transpose. And what I gain is the fact that this is known, this is known, right? I have computed this from equation three here. This is known because I computed it from equation three, uh, five. And these two, now, if you look closely, together form, again, my G matrix or the G hat matrix. And this is very nice because the G hat matrix can also be approximated or replaced by multiplication with U transposed from the right. So this gives me U sigma squared U transposed. Okay. And so this is very nice because now I have all quantities that I already know. And on top of this, I can cancel quite a few terms out. U sigma trans, uh, squared U transpose times U sigma inverse, which means U transpose and U cancel. And sigma squared and the sigma inverse means that I can cancel the second uh, multiplication by this one, okay? And so what I'm left with is U times sigma times this eigenvector matrix psi hat. And so all of these are very well known by equations three and five. So rather straightforward. Next step, this is the eigenfunction on all the samples I know. This is the kth eigenfunction on a sample I do not know. And I can basically do the exact same thing. I cannot use this trick because well, this one is not known. All I have to do is replace this, uh, all the sites where I have data already with a new evaluation, okay? So what I'm doing is phi of my new x, and these form sort of a, a basis uh, in which this is, you know, spanned. Um, u sigma plus psi hat. And so what you see here, this I know, this I know, this I know, and this one, is again something I can express in terms of kernel evaluations, okay? So easy enough, this becomes kernel of x with x1 until kernel of x with xm. And then times u, sigma, and psi. All right, so very straightforward, well known in all kernel techniques, new samples, the evaluation of new samples usually requires um, calling the kernel function with respect to all the existing samples and then, you know, measuring sort of the, the distance between the new one and these ones. Um, okay, but easy enough to do. So we're here, eigenfunctions. The only thing that's left now is the construction of the observable function and the Kuhlmann modes. So what we've seen in the fourth video on extended DMD is that this G function can be expressed in terms of, again, in this finite dimension subspace, the Kuhlmann modes VK times my eigenfunctions phi of x. Right? And if we do not consider this G of x, but let's say we express it in terms of, of our feature matrix here, Right. We will see in the end this makes only sense for, for full state observables, not for monomials because this blows up. But what we saw is that you can express your feature matrix in the same way. So this is now, let's say, a basis for, for this G function by taking the eigenfunctions and then multiplying with the Kuhlmann mode. So to say the, the matrix version of this one again. Um, and then C allows me to reconstruct the G function. And what I can do now is I can use this to construct the Koopman modes. 
uh, by simply multiplying from the left with the pseudo inverse. So this gives me the pseudo inverse of the eigenfunction matrix um, with my feature matrix. And what I can do now is I can use this result to compute this inverse efficiently. So what it means, invert independently and swap the order. So what I'm getting is inverse sigma pseudo inverse u transposed times psi x. Okay, so very easy. This argument is, you know, eigenfunctions times Cooper mode give me these observables. And then I express the inverse of these eigenfunctions by this um, SVD-like expansion, and I end up with this. The last thing I can do is now I can define these inverse, uh, I, the, the inverse of this eigenvector matrix by an eigenvector matrix from the left, right? So this dual basis argument that we have seen before. And what this means, in the end, that I can compute such a Koopman mode by a left eigenvector from this problem number five. So this is the only new computation that I actually have to do, solve the left eigenvalue problem as well. Times sigma plus u transposed psi x. Okay, and so this is actually very nice, but here's the only thing that is rather expensive, I would say, because we really actually have to lift in this higher dimensional space, which is why these Koopman modes only make sense if we do not lift this in two high dimensional spaces, for instance, if we want to consider the full state observable. Everything else, though, can also be done in, in higher dimensional spaces. You can also compute the K matrix using fancy monomials and then only multiply with the full set observable in the very last step. And this is what we're going to do in the code now. Let's have a look at this example. We have seen this before. So it's this uh, Kármán vortex street. We have the cylinder, flow enters from the left, roughly 90,000 degrees of freedom. And over time, this oscillates as we have seen before. And before we go to the kernel side of things, let's have a look at the dynamic mode decomposition. And we want to compare the DMD modes with the Koopman modes that we get via the kernel EDMD here. All right, so what we see is DMD, um, we have seen this before. You have the data matrix X, the data matrix Y is this, the same data basically shifted one time step to the future. And what you need to do is you need already here do an SVD. Um, if you're not sure why, there is a video, I'm going to put a link on this, on the efficient computation of the S uh, dynamic mode decomposition because if this is 90,000 dimensional, the K matrix would also already be 90,000 by 90,000. So what we have to do is we have to restrict it to some subspace and one uses again the SVD for this. So the details don't really matter, I would say. You have this U sigma Q decomposition of the data matrix, very similar to what I've done here, only on the full state. And one can then use efficient techniques yeah, in the flavor of what we've done here to compute these Koopman eigen um, the, 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 the dynamic modes. So here are the singular values decaying very nicely. Here are these basis functions, the use, and we only compute DMD on a subspace spanned by the first 150, I think. So it's really a lot already here. Um, as I said, the specifics don't really matter. This is really um, the classical DMD algorithm, but in this efficient version using an SVD decomposition and truncating to rank R, which is 150 in my case. Um, and what you get then is this is the eigenvalue spectrum of the K matrix in DMD. These are the most important ones if we talk about projecting our full state onto these individual um, DMD modes. So you see a few leading ones and these are the red ones that we have identified. And what I'm plotting here is now the real part and the complex part of, or the imaginary part of um, these most dominant eigenmodes. And you see this decomposition in larger patterns with lower frequency and smaller patterns with higher frequency, so very common in, uh, common in fluid mechanics, and the, the mean field on the top. Okay, so this is nothing new here and is basically unrelated to this um, the content of this video, but have a look at these images because we're going to compare them in a second. Okay? Because now we move on to the kernel EDMD algorithm and what I'm going to use is basically these 
five steps here and then compute the Koopman mode. So exactly as we before, I'm defining the kernel function here, which is the dot product in the inputs, not in the lifted space, and then raising it to the power two in my example. You could go higher because it does not scale with the feature space dimension. But we've seen for 90,000, this is already 10 to the nine roughly um, entries, or the, the, the dictionary size. Then I'm computing g hat and a hat, exactly as I've defined this in, in, in line two here, just a for loop over all my samples. And then I'm performing an eigenvalue decomposition of the g hat matrix. So this is my equation three on the board. So you get the, the u and the sigma for, for the kernel version. Then I can do some sorting so that the dominant ones or the, the lowest frequency ones are leading. And then I compute the k hat matrix, again, exactly as it's defined here. So the pseudo inverse of sigma times u transpose times a hat, you see, the way it goes here. And then all the way to the end. And then I'm doing step five, the eigenvalue decomposition of my k hat matrix. Again, very straightforward. Only thing I'm adding here already is the left eigenvalues uh, w by taking the eigenvectors of the transposed matrix. So easy enough. And again, some sorting that may not be so uh, relevant. What's really important in the end is these are the, so to speak, the kernel eigenfunctions, these phi's here. And this is the calculation of the Koopman mode exactly as I have derived it here, right? So W transposed times pseudo inverse um, times U, and now times, as I said, the full state because otherwise uh, it, it's not so, doesn't make sense to visualize this, so it's the projection onto the full state observable now. And what you see is, again, these are the eigenvalues of my DMD approximation, and you see no, it looks very similar to the DMD eigenvalues, only this is an M by M computation, so it avoids the high dimensional space altogether. Previously, we had to do this SVD approximation because otherwise we couldn't even do it with for standard DMD. And these are now the Koopman modes that we found. And you see that there's actually a great degree of similarity between what we found before and what we found in this kernel version. Okay, so this concludes this mini-series on kernel eDMD. I hope that it became quite clear, and even though the derivations appear to be a bit lengthy, let's say, in the end is these five equations and then maybe the left eigenvector and we're basically done. So thanks a lot for your attention and stay tuned for more content to come. Thanks. <laughs>